Uh, as you uh, may have uh, heard, we, we've run a number of these sessions. In fact, this is the, the sixth session. We've probably had about 350 people through in the last week or so. Uh, you, again, we had the smaller session, but uh, that's always nice to finish on a bit, bit smaller audience. In addition, we actually had uh, about 520 people come and see Daryl and myself speak a, a couple of weeks ago in the morning after the budget. Uh, what happens is every year when the budget comes out, about 7.30, of the night of the budget, we, we put together our thoughts and we get a bunch of people here staying up to one in the morning, then we troll, troll through all the papers and then we produce a, a presentation for a bunch of accountants, solicitors and other business people that were held at the, uh, at the uh, Adelaide Oval the next morning, so it was about 520 something people. In addition, you may notice that Rachel here is, is recording the session um, and that's so that we can actually send this out to uh, beyond the audience. Uh, that they're so able to attend because we have people that are interstate and overseas that, that are also interested. So we're quite astounded at the, at the level of interest in this budget and it's not just because Daryl and I are so good looking. It really was a significant budget. So what I want to talk about is I guess just like, first of all Tony Abbott's perspective on it was that this is more of a pain with purpose type budget. <coughs> Obviously the, the purpose being a, a little bit debatable but uh, again he's, he's talking about it being a short term pain mm -hmm. with, with a with it being a problem-solving budget that's supposed to be nation-building. Uh, so I, I guess that the, the sentiment that we need to, to rebuild and, and after the, uh, the position that the government's in is, is, is an unfortunate one that, that, uh, that some tough calls are being made. And what's interesting is that in some press overseas, there's actually been a bit of media uh, tension around uh, a bit of respect about how it's been approached. So it's interesting about a lot of debate on shore about this stuff, but overseas there's been quite a lot of... Uh, uh, appreciation the fact that Australia is at least addressing and taking tough action. So whether it's the right action, I guess only time will tell. Uh, so uh, with being paid with purpose, we'll be handing out aspirin on the way out. <laughs> now just in terms of the tax rates, uh, I, I guess there's, there's largely unchanged. The, uh, the tax rates are, are, are pretty much being uh, retained as they previously were. Um, of course there's the Medicare levy and the uh, debt, debt levy that I'll talk about. Um, but the issue of bracket creep that Daryl talked about is certainly a real one and that's certainly making for some interesting uh, situations I guess in terms of the massive amount of tax uh, that people are paying out there. Uh, in terms of the budget repair levy, this is an additional 2% on top of taxable incomes for people earning over 180000 It's only 2% on the money earned over 180000 sorry 130000 anyway. Uh, it's basically valid for three years uh, and uh, this is, a, again, a fairly significant amount of tax increase because it brings the effective top marginal tax rate to 49%. If we factor in a few other factors uh, uh, like the, um, the franking changes and things like that, it, it really is a bigger, bigger factor again. They're also bringing in line the fringe benefit tax rate to 49% uh, also from 1st of April next year just to make sure that there isn't any uh, disparity between the two. So really, I guess for someone that's on 200000 a year, it's about a $400 a year impact. Uh, and for those on 300000 about 2400 roughly uh, impact. So, so it's a fairly significant impact to what is already a, a high tax rate. Uh, again, we're pretty much of the view that there will be a, a tax reform as a result of this that will have to address some of these issues. So from July next year, the government pr pr proposes also to reduce the company tax rate by 1.5%. So really trying to ensure that the, the companies are in a position to try and continue to prosper uh, because obviously that's where employment comes from and uh, there's a certain amount of importance being placed on the recovery in, in, in the company uh, sector. So for large companies this reduction will offset the 1.5% levy that's funding the government's paid parental leave scheme. Uh, that also commences in July next year. Uh, the impact to investors is this, that there will be an impact on dividends because uh, companies with less than $5 million in turnovers will receive greater dividends but less franking credits, uh, so the net after-tax position will be the same. Uh, but that's not, largely not the kind of companies we, we're investing our clients' money in. So the companies we are mainly focused on is those with uh, income over $5 million a year. So the 1.5% reduction in tax that's being offset by the parental leave scheme uh, will mean that there's the same dividend but less franking credits. So when you allocated pensions and account-based pensions within superannuation, uh, when you go to have your tax return done, normally there's the refund of franking credits. There'll be a slight dent in that, and obviously uh, 
uh, this does leave people slightly worse off. The good news is that we've seen in the last quarter that uh, there, was a, there was a fairly reasonable lift in the average uh, dividend being paid out by a lot of the companies we look at. Uh, I think our, our list produced about an 8% increase in, in dividend year on year, so that was a fairly decent offset to this problem, I, I guess. So it will continue to, to make sure that we're focusing very much on where we're getting the income for your portfolios from. Uh, and, and again, as Daryl pointed out, perhaps with some of the changes to the, the way that mining companies are, are paying out, it, it, does, uh, it does change the, the way we might construct a portfolio in future. So again, a taxation review has been flagged and we're expecting that to be a pretty significant thing. Uh, superannuation was largely uh, left out of the, the budget in terms of changes, but we're anticipating uh, that there'll be some changes from this tax review. So it, it's going to be interesting to watch this space. Uh, in terms of strategy implications, to try and alleviate the tax burdens, uh, I guess the, the, the biggest thing is, of course, reducing taxable income. Just not working as much, that's clearly not a good solution. Um, but by reducing assessable income or increasing deductible expenditure seems to be the best place to start. So looking for tax deductions will probably mean that higher income earners are going to continue to look at strategies such as gearing, which is borrowing money to invest, uh, as a strategy to try and alleviate some of the, uh, the high income tax they'll be exposed to. Uh, we want to also put a little alert around capital gains tax because uh, someone might be earning less than 180000 and think, OK, I'm, I'm not affected by that. I'm, I'm on less of a tax rate. I'm not going to have to worry about this. But if you're, if you're realising a bunch of capital gains in a particular year, whether you're taking some profit from your share portfolio or selling a property, this, this capital gain could actually push you into that 180000 tax bracket. So we need to be very conscious of major asset sales in terms of the impact on portfolios and, and, and trying to make sure we offset these things. Uh, we've been talking a little about the fact that there is uh, obviously some, some uh, shelters from this where we've got things like contributions to super where there's tax deductions uh, for some eligible people as well as the, uh, the higher uh, tax free threshold these days. So there is some, some ways we can approach these things to keep the strategies, uh, uh, keep, you, keep you on the right side of that equation. But uh, it does take some work so we'll be working through these things, things very carefully. Uh, so pro proceed with caution with these things because some people are going to get caught out. Uh, we were also quite happy about this particular announcement which was about paying too much into super. A lot of people got caught out the last few years with overpaying into super as the contribution limits came down and, and caused quite a lot of people to overpay. We, we tend to believe that the administration cost for the government of actually dealing with all the people that overpay probably completely offset the amount of tax that was being taken in excess contribution tax. So largely what they decided to do was for non-concessional contributions uh, from 1st of July 2013, if they exceeded the cap, there'd be the ability just to pull the money back out and, and basically just level the, level the equation and, and the balance sheet correctly. Uh, and also taking out any associated earnings as well. So uh, final details of this policy, there's a bit of work to do, some consultation with the, with the industries, uh, superannuation industry to, to get this right. But uh, largely this is perhaps one of the more welcome measures in the budget. Age pension, pension access. This, this raised quite a lot of attention in the, in, the, uh, in the media and a lot of people are up in arms about it. Interestingly enough, the people up in arms about it are largely those people who are going to, to, to be unaffected by this because they're over the, the, the age of uh, this being affected. People my age are actually largely ignoring it, which is an issue I'll talk about in a minute. But, um, but basically what this means is that people born on or after 1 January 1966, uh, which is currently 48 years or younger, just you and me, apparently, Rachel. Um, we'll be basically having to wait to a 70 before eligible for the, uh, the age pension. Uh, so it's quite a, quite a substantial uh, lift from the, the current 65 to 66 uh, age groups that are eligible. And again, we're largely expecting superannuation will be readdressed. And uh, whether it's moved all the way out to age 70, that that's, seems unlikely initially, at least. But without a doubt, pushing it out beyond the current age and aligning it closer to this age of access to, uh, to Centrelink is, is likely. Uh, so it does raise some issues I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, this is the qualifying ages, so a nice little table of where everybody sits in there. Um, so Rachel, you can plug your own page in there and work out where you'll be. Uh, off the chart, basically. Um, so so, the, so really, this, the implications of this is, is again, superannuation may follow. But this is, I really want to stress that, and perhaps not so much for the people in the audience, but perhaps to stress to people you know that are going to be affected by this. 
is that there is really, this really does put an emphasis back on, on planning for retirement properly rather than just letting retirement happen. We've benefited obviously from the, from the, the removal of taxation on, on superannuation income streams uh, and, and largely the superannuation system allowed for the current generation of retirees to actually be the first one that really had retirement savings at their, their hands. Um, but of course, uh, a program of saving and investing outside super to fund the gap between the age of when someone wants to give up work and we can, when they can get their hands on super and Centrelink may be the most appropriate way to proceed. And assets can be also transitioned into super if they're accumulated outside super anyway. So one way to approach that would be investment bonds.